Hi, welcome to uh, Chicago Jewish Cafe. Today we have a very interesting guest. I have no idea what his real name is, but this Jewish novelist goes by the pen name of Manishtana. For those who may not know it, it's the first word of the most important question for Passover and means what is the difference. Manishtana, uh, he has written a very, very interesting book. I, I don't normally uh, uh, read novels, but I started and could not put it down. This is the book, which is actually doing quite well on Amazon. It's Ariel Samson, uh, Freelance Rabbi, and written by Manishtana. It's his novel. And uh, we're going to talk to him now and see uh, what kind of interesting things we're going to learn. Uh, my feeling is that any Jew should read this book because by reading this book, he's going to understand more about himself. Manishtana, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you? Not bad. Thank you very much. Uh, could you please tell us something about yourself? About myself. Um, African-American Orthodox Jew, uh, born and raised Chabad. Um, both my parents also African-American Jews. Um, on my mother's side, uh, my family has been here as African-American Jews in America since the 1780s. Um, I'm a writer, a speaker on racial and religious identity and how that intersection manifests, particularly around American Judaism. Sounds very interesting. Uh, you said that on your mother's side, your family has been Jewish since 70, 1780? Since the 1780s. What does it mean? How do you know that? Um, the same way any Jewish family knows that. <laughs> I do not know uh, when my family became Jewish, but you know exactly the date. Well, Why? we know when they showed up here. Huh? Uh, we know when they showed up here. Beyond that, it's like any other Jewish story where there's no was, sort of... Was, was your mother's family at that time uh, uh, were slaves or free? Um, no, actually. Uh, my mother's family came to America as free. Um, my great-grandfather on my mother's mother's side was a slave and escaped the plantation. Uh, his owner was also Jewish. So, um, uh, where was it on uh, mainland uh, America or some this island? This is uh, Virginia. Virginia. Yeah. So, uh, as I understand, there were about twenty-two thousand Jewish families that did have slaves. Um, by eighteen sixty, a quarter of the American Jewish South were slave owners. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll touch on the subject because that subject is of interest to me. Uh, mm -hmm for the reasons you'll understand. In any case, uh, I, as I said, uh, I read your book. Very, very interesting. You have an amazing language and you touch on uh, topics that, you know, a person like me just would pass by without noticing, but you actually make good points. Um, I asked you uh, in preparation for our uh, conversation to read maybe uh, uh, a page or so from the book. Uh, 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 could you do it? I can, yes. Uh, I'll pull up a little snippet here. Um, this is a bit of a conversation. Well, it's really just a one-sided sort of story. Uh, when Ariel, the main character, is meeting Kalman for the first time. Kalman is um, his sort of best white Jewish Orthodox friend. Um, and that's how their friendship is sort of what sets like one of the major points of the novel into play. So they first meet, you know, in, in Israel, that's uh, like at a party. And so uh, Kalman comes over and sort of like introduces himself and uh, sort of just goes into this story that he like just burns up inside him. So I'm just gonna go right into it. So uh, yeah, I work for a driving school in Crown Heights the messed up stuff I hear, like, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I'm driving this one dude, this is the guy, driving him up to the Bronx for his road test. And he turns to me and he's like, 
is there a lot of blacks up here? And, and he says it in this sort of like annoyed voice. Like he just walked into a pizzeria for a slice of pizza, but everyone there is a horse. And I like, seriously, I get this question all the time. So I go, yeah, this is a mostly black neighborhood. And the guy snorts and he's like, are they anti-Semites? I just roll my eyes at him and go, so do you like black people? And his face goes all pale, like I just insulted his mother or something. Anyway, he doesn't have an answer for like a while. So then I go, well, just so you know, they're not. But if you're going to be racist against them, why shouldn't they be racist against you? And this, at this he kind of just waves his hand at me and says, all these Schwarzers, they're all low lives, walking around with their pants around their butts, just thugs and drug dealers. And I kind of flip out on him and pull the car over to the curb. I'm like, are you serious? And I point to this one black guy leaning up against the world and leaning up against the wall in a Spider-Man shirt and go, do you see his pants around his butt? He's a drug dealer. What has he ever done to you? So this smirk jerkwad just shrugs and says, he's from Ham, Ham is course, all the Schwarzes are. And I, I just close my eyes for a second and I take a deep breath. And then I turn to him and say, so what do you do for a living? He's surprised and says, I, I run a light fixture company. So how sweaty are you when you come home? He looks a little confused, but says, not very. When you're eating breakfast or lunch or dinner, whatever, are you especially sad? No. And right there, I've got him. So I say to him, well, why not? Adam was cursed too after he ate from the tree. By the sweat of your brow, you shall eat your bread. So why don't you come home sweaty? In suffering shall you eat the earth from the earth all the days of your life. So why aren't you sad when you're eating? So now this guy starts looking all uncomfortable and says, I don't understand. And I go, well, you're saying it's okay for you to be a jerk to all black people because Tom was cursed, right? But you were cursed to sweat for your bread and you don't. You were cursed to eat in suffering, but you don't. Do you believe you're obligated to sweat for your bread and eat in sour because you're cursed? No. So why do you think that people created in the same telemental scheme as you are obligated to suffer your racism because Ham was cursed? Why do you get to get out of a curse that is explicitly mentioned in the Torah, but you get to hold an entire race to a curse that isn't? And what does this guy say? Oh, I've never thought about it that way. And so I say, great. You have something to think about now. And then I point to the black dude in the Spider-Man shirt again and say, your road test examiner is waiting for you. Like, it really bothered me that he'd never even thought about it. I mean, the fact of human beings, not just Jews, human beings being created in God's image. And it's right there before the Torah says anything about Jews or Judaism or religion or anything. Like, you can quote this Gemara and say with that Mima from the Rebbe, but you couldn't make it 27 lines into literally the first Jewish book to ever exist. Anyway, I just want to say it's really messed up that you have what you have to go through, and I'm really sorry for that. And that I really respect you for being a push through it all. Ariel Sampson looked at this new stranger, amused and impressed. Ariel Sampson, he introduced himself. Kalman Meltzer. They clinked bottles. Very good. Thank you. Uh, now, I thought actually that you were going to read a different passage that is called <laughs> 116, but the book is full of, full of revelation. You know, if I uh, were to recommend this book to anybody, it would be uh, not a book written simply by uh, a Jew who is black, but a book about uh, uh, being a black Jew, but a book about me. Because when I come in contact with characters and situations in these books that you describe, that you talk about, I'm forced to think about my own idea of what makes me a Jew. What am I? You know, I was born in the Soviet Union. And in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, we had the idea. There was no religion. There was no Torah law. There was nothing. You know, some, there were some underground Jews, you know, Orthodox Jews, very few, uh, and they were underground. 
Now, and we recognize each other by sight. When um, uh, my daughter grew up a little bit, and uh, I told her once, oh, this guy does not look like a Jew. See, because we recognize other Jews by sight. That is a difference between a Jew and Ukrainian or Russian or somebody else or Mongol or whatever, or so black guy. So we normally put all of those faces outside of being black. When I came to the United States, and eventually, after a long time, I became um, uh, an observant Jew, a sort of observant, moderately observant, not the same way as you are. <laughs> Uh, at least I have accepted the idea of Jews and God. It was 1989. So I was at that time five years old. Uh, and, uh, uh, and my daughter just looked at me and just was, what do you mean? What does a, what does a Jew look like? And that was for the first time that I started to think, about Jews differently, and I got deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And today, of course, I do not see Jews by sight, but see Jews by their uh, 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 by their fit in definition of what is a Jew from the point of view of the Jewish law, halacha. How do you define a Jew? I would define it the same way. Um, that's always an in interesting question that I get. You don't look Jewish. And I say, uh, that's funny. I, I'm wearing a kippah and tzitzit. How do I not look Jewish? <laughs> well, but even if you didn't, I have to say, in my book, even if you didn't, uh, if your mother or father, and there, there I disagree with the interpretation of uh, halakha by the Orthodox, um, I consider that person to be 100% Jewish, providing that person says that he is a Jew. You know, confirms that he is a Jew. Now, uh, being a Jew, black Jew, in the United States, I mean, being a Jew anywhere <laughs> is not an easy form of human existence. I mean, being a Jew in the Soviet Union he had its own specificities uh, 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 that uh, may compete with any of your experience of being a black Jew. But let me ask you a question. Uh, you were born uh, a Jew, right? Mm -hmm. So as you were growing up, you were growing up in black community, or, or were you growing among white Jews? We lived in black community um, for a lot of times, but we also lived in white Jewish communities. We lived in both communities. Okay. Now, in, uh, given from what I read from your book, and now, of course, it's uh, only semi-autobiographical uh, novel, not fully uh, <laughs> uh, autobiographical novel. So, uh, what did you feel, I mean, as you were growing up, your parents told you you're a Jew, right? By the way, you use adjective Jewish all the time where I would use a Jew. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, I find it like completely clarifies where there's no, you know, question of what I'm talking about because there are groups that aren't Jewish but they use like the term, the adjective, the, the identifier of Jew, I'm a Jew. But those groups tend to never say they're Jewish. And so to sort of delineate between, like I, I am African-American, Halachic, Jew, Orthodox, all of those things. And so I find using the adjective Jewish helps to drive that point home with no confusion. Do you define yourself as African American first or as a Jew first? Uh, that's an interesting question. I feel like, like, would would you say you describe yourself as a man first or a Jew first? It's just. Well, just, uh, I, I'm a biologically a man. But <laughs> if, if I biologically a Jew. 
uh, well, but as I said, you know, yes, uh, a Jew does not need to be, and I do not know really what biologically, it's been now a long time, <laughs> and a long uh, thing, you know, because going back to Adam and Eve, we all brothers, regardless whether we're Jews or not. Exactly. And uh, by the way, this is uh, 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 one of the most uh, 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 Jews were made fun of this statement by Greeks and Romans all throughout history during that period. Because for them, it was obvious how crazy Jews had to be to even think something like this. You know, today, Jews, uh, at least believing Jews, are thought crazy by some so-called scientific minds uh, because we insist on the story of Adam and Eve to be reality of our human existence because many people think that the proper way of looking at Jews and the world is that we come all from amoeba. Or sort of like this. Now, you say that your mother comes become, uh, became a Jew or came as a Jew? What? what in 1780, what, is, what does it mean? I... Great, I think my seven times great grandmother came here as a Jew. From where? Uh, Nigeria, as far, as far as we can tell so far. From Nigeria? Her name was Judea. <laughs> Just one second. Did she come as a slave or she came as a free person? She came free. She came free. How did she come? This is a very interesting story. Um, she came with her parents. We don't know their names, but we know her name. And she was Jewish. Yep. Wow, that is a story all in its own right. Uh, <laughs> was she from tribe of Igbo? Among the Igbo, there are Jew there are Igbo with Jewish ancestry. Not all Igbo are Jewish, but there are Igbo that do have. Um, you know that many of them say that they're Jewish, and uh, uh, what's his name, this Rabbi uh, 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 Fanya, Fanya uh, mm -hmm. from south side of Chicago, uh, he uh, travels there a lot, and uh, one of the leaders of um, Jews, uh, or people who say they're Jewish in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not know, do you know this Rabbi? I, I do know uh, Rabbi Fonye. Uh, it's funny that you should bring him up because that ties back into your question earlier about why I use Jewish instead of Jew. Because um, a lot of uh, Rabbi Fonye's congregation and uh, even his own background is from a group of African Americans that decided to take on a Jewish identity. Uh, they call themselves either Black Hebrews or Hebrew Israelites or Black Jews but they don't fall under any of the definitions of being Jewish by whichever denomination you want to hold by. Uh, Rabbi Fane himself did go through a conversion, so he is Jewish. However, his ordination- Through conservative, not orthodox, conservative. Not conservative, he's conservative Jew by conservative definitions. However, his ordination is not a Jewish ordination, it's a Hebrew Israelite uh, ordination. So which, while has, which is what? What is Hebrew is Israelite? Hebrew Israelites around the beginning of the 19th century um, because there are so many similarities and resonances between the Jewish slavery story in Exodus and the African American slavery experience. Uh, at a certain point, African Americans stopped identifying with the story, the Jewish story of the Exodus, and started identifying as Jews. Um, and so created their own synagogues and their own sort of ways of practicing and refused to sort of go by what was traditional halakhic law where if you don't have any Jewish parents and you have to convert to be Jewish. Uh, also in some cases, these were people that actually did try to convert to Judaism, but the racial environment such as it was, like rejected them. And so they just went into this sort of African nationalist version of Judaism, much like how the nation of Islam isn't Islam. It's not one of the sects of Islam. And it's really like an African nationalist movement rejecting Christianity and picking up a different religion. 
So Hebrew Israelites are sort of the Jewish branch of that movement, and the Nation of Islam is like the Islamic kind of branch. Well, Hebrew, within my definition, those Hebrew Israelites would not be Jews. Exactly. So, but they do call themselves Jews sometimes, which is why I make sure to see them Jewish. Christians, or Christians call themselves real Jews. It does not make them Jews. <laughs> and Muslims call themselves really obedient Jews and does not make them Jews. So it's the same sort of scenario and dynamic that happens there. Right. So. But uh, uh, you, from what I understand, although I do not know your first or last name, I do consider you Jew like me without any difference. So Manishtana would be no <laughs> Well, the reason why I have that is one, yes, it's, it's asking, I'm asking the question in my work, what makes this Jew so different from any other Jew? And the answer is yes, nothing. But the answer is also everything. Yes, we can go into the same Jewish space and have two completely Jewish experiences because of what our outward phenotypical appearances, our cultural experiences in our countries and here in this country. Like, you could probably walk into a corner store by which you might leave. I'd walk through the same corner store and I'd get followed around. That's has nothing to do with me being Jewish. It does have something to do with me being black. And that does have an impact on my Jewish. Uh, Manishna, could you please do me a favor sure. and uh, uh, read uh, uh, the passage from page 116. 116, what's happening here? Oh, this is a good one. I do like this. So here the narrator uh, starts off this chapter, the secret narrator. And uh, it's about Ariel going to the shul that he's, they're deciding whether or not they're going to hire him to be his rabbi, to be the rabbi. So I don't go to shuls anymore. Haven't in a very long while. Just got tired of all the where are you from? When did you convert? What brings you here? But near the end of when I still did, the one thing I hated even more than the pedophiles was people telling me that I had a chip on my shoulder. Like, that showed absolutely no grasp or appreciation for my experience of showing up in the first place at all. It was pretty much the same for Ariel. Take his morning, for example. Ariel lived on the border, on the border between the neighborhoods of Black, Flatbush, and Jewish, Midway. It was almost a metaphor for his life. And this morning, like every Saturday morning, Ariel first had to walk through the stairs of his Afro-Caribbean American neighbors as he walked through the black side of town. Those judgmental gazes at the confused black man they perceived to be Ariel to be, a sellout, rejecter of the grace of the good Lord Jesus, lackey of the white man. True, there were scattered nods of approval, an appreciative good morning from older black folks gratified to see a young man who still know how to dress respectively. But for the most part, it was buses that lazily ambled by in clouds of brain growl exhaust, full of shaking heads and disapproving frowns cast down from tinted windows. Shouts of, hey, hey you, Jew boy, for mischievous children up too early with too much energy on a Saturday morning. Or the, hey, hey Sammy Davis, from the adults who should not only have known better, but should have had something more constructive to do with their day off. Passengers leaning out of cars, jeering as they sat stopped at red lights, taking pictures or even videos with their camera phones of this anomalous black dude dressed in a suit and a skull cap, his flowing calf length prey shell flapping in the breeze as if he were the Jewish superhero of lost causes and identities. And then, Ariel would cross into the Jewish part of town and there he'd greet his fellow Jews with a Shabbat Shalom and be greeted with a blank stare of silence. A uh, good Shabbos spat out so quickly it might have well been his needs or his favorite, a frozen smile and a thank you. He'd get, scared at, he'd get stared at by children and their parents from cross streets or have double takes taken after he passed them by. Without fail, there was always someone Ariel caught staring when he turned around and he secretly relished watching them turn the most magnificent shades of red as they quickly whipped their heads round forward again. Not to mention the upturned noses from Jews old enough to have survived the Holocaust, yet somehow along the way forgot what that look felt like. And all that was before he'd even reached the synagogue threshold. The fact that Ariel didn't walk into shul literally ticking like a time bomb and exploding was nothing short of a sheer miracle. 
Very nice. I mean, uh, uh, to me, it shows, you know, both sides and uh, both uh, environments that make it very difficult to be a Jew like Ariel is. Let me ask you a question. Uh, do you know how many uh, uh, black Jews in the United States? One in every four Jews in America is a Jew of color. Just one second. Are you talking about a million? A million and a half? 20% of all American Jews are Jews of color. Where, where did you get the statistics? This is from a study done about 15 years ago from Bechol Uh I believe Brandeis did an updated study about a couple of years ago. That would be very interesting. After this conversation, I would appreciate it if you'd email me uh, uh, URL or some uh, uh, sure. source for this information, because I have to be very honest with you. You know, uh, I have not seen that many black Jews, whether in the United States or in other countries. I mean, I think that you are the third uh, uh, black Jew that I'm talking to. The first one was a girl that I flew with uh, in an uh, uh, airplane to Israel one time. She was an uh, Ethiopian Jew. Another was also an Ethiopian Jew here at Sportus College. Uh, he came as a student. And you're the third one. And you are not Ethiopian. You're American Jew. I find it very funny when people say that they've never seen like any other Jews of color or a black Jew. I did and not say I've never seen. I said I've never <laughs> talked. And I talk to you. I love it when they say they've never seen and never met, never encountered. And I like to do this and say, how do you know? Well, the, that's the point I started with. <laughs> exactly. That's why I did not say if you have not seen, because I might have seen, but did not recognize. Because as I said, in the Soviet Union, you, at least I could, you know, like Don't a dog, me. by smell, by uh, <laughs> sight, by everything, recognize a Jew and differentiate the Jew from non-Jew. And not only me, most of other Jews were able to do the same, you know, because there was no way, I mean, for, first of all, uh, uh, to be a Jew was a completely different thing than what is I see now. And, um, but in any case, so uh, you say that one and a half million, because I thought that it was, uh, some estimates 20,000, some estimates 200,000. But that was the, uh, 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 the scissors, the spread, that, uh, but not a million and a half, like you just said. There are millions of Jews of color in this country. <laughs> millions? There are millions. So, so you should have a big company, right? Yeah. <laughs> you? Um, the issues that get brought up in the book are the reasons why. Uh, there are very but here, few. Uh, here, as you walk from one part of the town to another, uh, you strike, or this aerial strikes, uh, a figure of a very, very lonely Jew. I definitely think he feels that way sometimes. Not like he's surrounded by hundreds of thousands or millions of other Jews like him. Um, because of like issues that I bring in the book, um, his sister no longer practices. There are other people who uh, they're in Jewish spaces and either the racism gets too much for them or they're just constantly getting hurt or constantly getting questioned and they decide it's easier to just be whatever I am. It's easier to be just black and not black and Jewish. It's easier to be just Asian, not Asian. Uh, so basically, you, when, when you say that one and a half million whatever black Jews, you are talking about just simply uh, Jews who happen to be black due to biological connection to their ancestors. That's what you mean? How do you mean? Well, it means like this. Your, uh, uh, this Ariel sister, you know, she is no longer a Jew. She does not want anything to do with Jews. She became Christian, I think. She converted here. Not converted, but just, just goes along with it. So you mean Jews like that, right? Yeah. I mean, that's among, there, is, there are Jews in literally every denomination that exists. And they intermarry, and uh, so the, their offsprings, you know, they have some uh, idea that their ancestors two, three generations back were Jews, and uh, or had something to do with Jews, and therefore they considered that they're Jews, right? Well, there are many different uh, 
pretty much the exact same definitions that happens with you know mainstream white Jews. Those same definitions exist within Jews of color. However, you want to define what the Jewish population of America is, that same definition would apply to Jews of color. Okay, so and, and, and if that is the case, let's, let's say that I will accept your definition, which we can play with. I'm not sure that I would call them Jews. I would call them offsprings of Jews. Well, but uh, you have to cut down a lot of the American Jewish population too, then. Uh, yes, possible. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it depends how far they are separated from other Jews, and uh, you're right, you know, because there could be other problems with the uh, with being an offspring. But uh, where this one and a half million black Jews, or just Jews, of, you count as black Jews, or Jews of color in general, that includes like Asian, Hispanic, Indian. Oh, no, 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 no. Let, let's stay with black Jews. You know, let's not uh, 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 allow ourselves go <laughs> on tangent like this. So not that's, little, that's a smaller percentage of the 20 percentage. That might be around, I believe Brandeis has it at maybe 4 or 8 percent. 4 or 8 percent. Yes. Well, 4 or 8 percent would then make it uh, 3 to... 500,000, 300,000 to 400,000. But even at that number, where did they come from? Um, all kinds of origins. Uh, there are people who converted, and there are people who get adopted into... Conversion, I mean, conversion is not, as you yourself know very well, it's not an easy and fast product. It's not a, a process. It's not like becoming a Christian or Muslim. Uh, to be a Jew is a very difficult... Uh, 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 process of becoming a Jew. You know, it's not like boom, 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 and that's it. It's like getting a master's degree. But uh, so we have conversions, we have adoptions, we have uh, intermarriage, we have people who are born Jewish. All the entire gamut. Conversion, adoption. Jews do not have adoption under halacha. You have adoption. Well, so it's the same thing. You adopt and you convert the kid under halacha. So, okay. so in any case, so you're talking about conversion, right? Uh, that's one aspect. It's the same makeup again as the mainstream American Jewish society. We have people. Okay. Who are in any case, uh, uh, I would appreciate it if you'd send it to me, you know, after this conversation. Sure. Of course, because I am interested. Why am I interested? Because there was, uh, as we just mentioned in the beginning of our conversation, um, from one source. I see that there was 22,000 uh, Jewish slave-owning families mm -hmm. in the South. I do not know that number, 22,000. I don't know where that number is from from either, but... You do know? I don't know where that number is from. But... Yeah, I do not know because it was given by the uh, uh, scriptwriter for a show about a uh, um, uh, situation with black slaves in Jewish families at the end of the Civil War. Yes. Uh, he mentions 22,000. I asked him, and he says 22,000, but need to get a little bit deeper. Uh, and uh, uh, as you know, under Halacha, when um, a slave is purchased by a Jew for household needs, he becomes, in fact, partially a Jew. Mm -hmm. That is, with the requirements of observing at least uh, 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 those uh, 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 non-time-bound commandments that would also be incumbent on women. Like a Jewish woman. Yes. Now, and when he once becomes uh, a Jewish slave, household slave, he can no longer be uh, either uh, manumitted, freed, and be non-Jew, or sold to a non-Jew, mm -hmm. is automatically, under Jewish law, when he is manumitted, becomes a free Jew. That is the Jewish law. That is halacha. That is the halacha. However, that is not how things played out during the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, I'm not sure. talking about slave trade. I'm talking about 1863. Because in 1863, when the slavery was abolished, mm -hmm. 
in the United States. My question is, what happened to those 22, at least 22,000 slaves? Well, first we have to go back to the slave trade because it was largely Christian dominated and Jews were an underclass. And so in a vacuum, that would be the halakha. You, you get a male slave, you, uh, he gets mila, you dunk him in mikvah, same for the female slaves. But in most cases, Jews were sold slaves under conditions that they would not do that to their slaves. So they most- were not, they, they were not purchasing those slaves for household needs. They were purchasing for business. That is- Well, the ones that were here, so the they, in the house that were, those were household slaves. But generally speaking, the requirements of a Jew buying a slave were not uh, followed uh, when it comes to American slavery. Um, after the end of the Civil War, that is how you have a lot of black families with like Jewish names like Israel or Levine or Cohen. Um, that's also, again, where you have uh, Hebrew Israelites saying, oh, we're Jews because this is what happens when you buy this. And we had a Jewish family. Well, except in that case, the family didn't do that. So again, it would have been applicable. That would have been the story. However, practically, that's not what actually happened on the ground. Um, so a lot of these families either they become Hebrew Israelites or they're just aware in the background that they had a Jewish slave owner somewhere. Uh, so you're saying that these Hebrew Israelites actually connect in their mind uh, their uh, 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 affiliation with Hebrew Israelites with that starting point in uh, uh, when they or their ancestors became free? Some do. Not all. Some do, some don't. The ones that have studied and know more about like Jewish law, and that's you know what they uh, hook on to and claim. Um, but again, that's not a an overarching ideology throughout the entire movement. Which synagogue do you go to? Um, currently, I go to a Chabad, uh, and when I don't go to Chabad, I run uh, a minyan. A private minion with like our neighbors here. Right. There's enough in your neighborhood. There's enough uh, Jews there to make a minion. Not every week, uh, but the weeks that there are, we we go to the house of one neighbor. We have our Torah there, Kiddush. We go to the whole shebang. We had Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur services. So yeah. very nice. Um, just came out. Uh, uh, results of a survey of uh, uh, increased uh, dislike of Israel on the part of black Americans. Mm -hmm. Something like less than one out of five of black Americans thinks that Israel is the ally of the United States. Now, and from previous surveys, we know that the level of anti-Semitism in black community is two to three times higher than among whites. Now, you being part of the black community, that probably causes you engage in all kinds of conversations with your uh, uh, non-Jewish black neighbors. True. And, and what kind of a conversations, if you... I, mean, I do not need names, just general. <laughs> um, well, first, we need to distinguish the difference between white anti-Semitism and black anti-Semitism. For both anti-Semitisms, the premise is that Jews are white. Only, only white people can be Jews. For white anti-Semitism, it's anti-Semitism where Jews are trying to infiltrate white spaces and like rule the world and trying to disenfranchise real white people. And so that's where white anti-Semitism sort of gets its ground from. Black anti-Semitism, it's still the same concept of Jews being white, but it's not necessarily tied to them being Jews. It's just them being another kind of white person in the structure of white supremacy and patriarchy that exists in the country. I mean, in both cases, you'll also have sort of the Christian Jew killer, Christ killer uh, sort of narrative. But what feels 
black anti-Semitism and white anti-Semitism are two different things. So it would make sense that anti-Semitism would be on the rise or be two or three times more in black communities, particularly in communities that a lot of real estate is owned by unfortunately slumlord Orthodox Jewish landlords. So that's going to increase that sort of anti-Semitism where it's not anti-Semitism as in, oh, these Jews because of their religion and how they practice and their history or their culture, which is, oh, this other white person. I think the slam, uh, uh, this uh, uh, slum landlord idea of a Jew among blacks is uh, 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 the other way, a product of black anti-Semitism. Because when black owns much worse slums, you do not have the same reaction on the part of other blacks. Mm. That's probably true. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't have any... Do with them being slumlords? No, no, I'm not saying it has to do with it. I'm saying that sort of adds to the narrative. I understand. And when, you, when you have, like, how many stories do we see in the news of, oh, these two or three brothers just got arrested for this, and they own all these buildings and these horrible conditions, and we see a lot of those stories, and there are a lot of stories that don't get to the news. I've been tenants of those kinds of landlords. <laughs> Uh, and so it's, it's really uh, a difference. So I don't have the bulk of the black anti-Semitic conversations because I'm not white. So therefore I don't even fall into their conception of what anti-Semitism is because in their heads, Jews are white. I do have the anti-Semitism conversations where the anti-Semitism is fueled from the Christian sort of Christ killer narrative. And that is nowhere near, at least in my experience and the experiences that I've had, uh, the majority of what fuels black anti-Semitism. Just like the majority of what fuels white anti-Semitism is not that Christian Christ killer. It's we Jews will not replace this. You know, one world, Zionist world order, the protocols of elders of Zion uh, trying to like gain power. So even white anti-Semitism isn't Christian fueled. Yeah, well, each anti-Semite he has his own reason to hate Jews. I mean, it has the same uh, results. <laughs> but the, uh, when, uh, not the look in the background is different. <laughs> not necessarily the same result. I mean, the anti-Semitism in France uh, was no less intense, and maybe even more intense on certain level than anti-Semitism in Germany. But the sum total of all factors led Germans to become large-scale murderers mm -hmm. that did not cause French to become large-scale murderers of the same sort yeah. as Germans. So uh, the, the feeling and the uh, sense of what it is, uh, you know, results in certain things only because of certain environment and factors and politics in that particular place and time. But in any case, um, we as Jews always talk about you know, unity. Now, I don't believe that Jewish unity requires us uh, uh, um, getting together and constantly singing, you know, some nice song and dancing together, but uh, requires recognition of all of us as Jews, as part of uh, the brotherhood uh, uh, that serves uh, 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 God, that uh, took us out of Egypt and met us at the Mount Sinai. I do not know where that Mount Sinai is, but wherever it is, I believe that our ancestors did go there and were met there. Uh, so if we have, you know, like for example, as I said, you know, black uh, uh, Israelites or uh, Hebrew Israelites, uh, uh, I would have to say, I do not consider them Jews at all. Um, unless they come, either convert or reaffirm their connection with the Jewish people. Jews, like anybody else, has the right to determine who we are and who belongs to us. Or well, you don't think so? No, that's true. I agree with you. <laughs> no, if somebody says that, oh, I'm a better Jew than you are, but I was not born Jewish, I did not convert, I do not do anything Jewish, I say, okay. In your mind, you're a better Jew than I am, but I still have the right to not recognize you as a Jew. I mean, we have guidelines that have been there for thousands, 
of years. Okay? You have to abide by at least one of them. If any of the groups of Judaism that exists, whether it's your mother, whether it's your father, whether, if you're not abiding by any of those, and they all have conversion processes, which, which regardless of which parent they say is the primary parent, if you're not doing any of that, then you can't, you can't say you're part of that club. <laughs> it's like not, a family reunion, but you didn't marry anyone in the family. Uh, do you, uh, how do you say it? Uh, how often, or what would you, what would be your prescription uh, for uh, uh, better, not integration, but um, better um, understanding? Of, because without understanding, you know, for example, when I meet Sephardic Jew, I recognize him as a Jew. You know, if he says that he is a Jew, uh, I say, well, fine. You know, Sephard, uh, Sephardim also are Jews, you know, like me. Uh, and I'd like uh, uh, for uh, black Jews, I mean, in Israel, it's its own set of issues. Mm. But black Jews in the United States to be recognized by uh, non-black Jews, whatever it is, you know, white Jews, whatever, as part of our... Jewish community. What would you say uh, would be a good thing to do to move situation in that direction? Study. Study of what? Anything. <laughs> study of history, study of Torah, study of Gemara, study of Midrash. And you'll see how nonsensical the yeah, but first of all, we need to know something about black Jews, you know, because, to, like, for example, we start talking about it, it went from one and a half million to uh, uh, 500,000, uh, because you included in one and a half million Jews from India, no, 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 what I, what, you asked uh, how many black Jews, I said Jews of color are 20%. No, I, I don't care about you. 20%. No. It breaks down. Black Jews, there is black, you know, from uh, African Americans, you know, here in the United States. Caribbean. Color from India or for some other, it's a completely different situation. Sure. We can talk about it separately. But I'm talking about black Jews in the United States. I'd like to know uh, how many of them are, where they're located. Uh, uh, who they are, what they think about themselves and their connection to Jewish people, and how they identify themselves as Jews, you know. So I would be able to accept them. If, if, if a guy tells me, you know, I'm a Jew, uh, but I'm for Louis Farrakhan, or I'm a Jew, but uh, uh, I, 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 I love Jesus, I say, <laughs> you're not a Jew in my book. <laughs> Well, black Jews here in America, they define themselves the same way that white Jews do. You have orthodox ones, conservative, reconstructionist, reformed, secular, atheist, agnostic, unaffiliated. You there, just, I, I, do you live in uh, Chicago or New York? New York. New York. Is there is a reform uh, 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 synagogue uh, uh, where a majority of uh, members are black Jews? Um... <sighs> When it comes to racial diversity, you will find more racial diversity in more liberal denominations. You'll find more black Jews and other Jews of color in reform spaces. I think more in reform spaces than conservative spaces and reconstruction spaces. But there's no, there's no reform uh, 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 temple that is uh, largely majority black, right? I wouldn't know. I'd have to ask someone who prays reform. I can tell you how demographics and orthodox spaces, I can't really tell you specifics in non-orthodox spaces. I know that B'nai Jeshurun has a large Everest population. Um, Kolo Chayeno in Brooklyn, I think that might have a good amount. Um, but beyond those two, I can't, I couldn't really tell you off the top. It would be interesting. Uh, I, I, I have in mind uh, one time to interview uh, uh, Rabbi Fanier, mm -hmm. if I pronounce his name correctly. I do not know if I do. <laughs> I think that's correct. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, because he, he has an interesting background and uh, uh, his relationship to Obama's family. 
mm -hmm. and uh, the use by Obama family of his Jewishness at the appropriate moment for Obama, when Obama was accused in many ways rightly of being enemy of Israel, he decided to activate, which was until time underground, you know, nobody knew about that connection. He decided to activate and make public through forward the connection between his wife and uh, uh, Rabbi Fania. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but this Rabbi Fania is also of interest to me because I have a good friend, uh, Dominic Kim. His, uh, uh, his father is uh, Korean, his mother is uh, Nigerian. Um, he is not Jewish. <laughs> He wants to be a Jew. I tell him, don't. <laughs> keep whatever you don't are. Do it. Don't, do it. don't do it. Don't do it. Just Get out of here. Run. Very, very, very carefully. <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, he gave me all kinds of information about uh, situation um, in Nigeria and different thoughts. And then, of course, I remember from uh, my Soviet past, uh, that uh, uh, Biafra was a big uh, thing uh, in the Soviet Union, although the Soviet Union supported the Muslims in fight against Igbo, um, uh, who were the mainstay of Biafra, that is the thing. So I, I want to talk to him. But uh, I also want to, I do not want to in any way exclude the Jews who are black from the idea of community. I mean, when I say, uh, the reason I say idea of community of Jewish people in the United States is because there's really no real community of Jewish people that is organized. So, but, the, but there's idea. I have an idea, you have an idea, no? Manishina, do you have an idea of what is a Jewish community in the United States is? I do. And what is it? My idea of community in of Jewish community in the United States is one that understands, and well, one that can accept that one, yes, it doesn't matter what you look like, a Jew is a Jew, but can also conceive of that not working out. That's not how it practically works in the country that we live in, in the experiences that we have and the backgrounds that we come from and one that also takes into account that diversity is not it's a Hasidic phrase uh, saying that I just can't remember who said it but it's that unity is not uniformity true unity is the unity that comes from diversity I agree with you 100 with with definition of unity I agree with you. I do not like the idea of unity, uh, 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 as you said, uniformity. I don't. And, uh, 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 but there has to be an idea of community. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about, because I do believe the Jews are not simply some uh, members of religious affiliation, but we are a member of a nation. We're a member of a family. What is it? We're a member of a family. Yes, we are. Judaism, what works, I, huh? Judaism works exactly like a family. People try to say, oh, it's a race, or it's religion, or it's a set of laws. It's, it's all of those. It's a family. Just like you have a family. We're sure there's the main part of the family, and they're all biologically connected to each other. But they're here to be limits. They're here to be When it can marry in, and they are now part of the family because they married into the family, or they can adopt right. somebody, and now they're part of the family. So but not if they come and start raping a woman. Yeah, they just can't just walk into the house and say, oh, I'm part of the family. Right, I, I, I am a Jew and that's it, you know, yeah. because I said so, I say no. Judaism works, it's a family. We're part of a family. Anyway, so we, you see, we already got one <laughs> point of agreement on which we can build. In any case, uh, Manish Tana, it was a true pleasure talking to you. It was definitely a pleasure. It was an experience. And your book is great. As I said, you know, uh, one of the reasons that I don't uh, uh, read too many novels is because I don't care for dialogues and uh, things like this. But yours 
is actually very easy to read. It's very interesting. Thank you. And uh, I do recommend it. I mean, your book is doing well on Amazon. And uh, I hope it's going to do even better because I think all Jews, uh, white and black Jews in America, need to read this book in order to be able to understand themselves. That is themselves, not others, but to understand oneself. In any case, nice talking to you. Nice talking to you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Gam lecha, And the very best. Nice talking to you. Hope to, it's not going to be the last time. Yeah, Take it easy. <laughs>